Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this exclusive Waterstones Telegraph event here at our offices. Uh, for those who don't know, we're just perched above the newsroom, one of the largest newsrooms in Europe. Um, tonight, we're very lucky to have a particularly special guest. He is one of Britain's best-selling novelists, author of nine novels, including Fatherland, Enigma, Pompeii, and The Ghost, which have been translated into no fewer than 37 languages and have sold more than 10 million copies. He's also been a formidable political journalist who was given unprecedented access to Tony Blair during the 1997 general election campaign. His latest thriller, our focus for tonight, is An Officer and a Spy. And it is a brilliant, compelling retelling of the Dreyfus Affair, one of the greatest um, miscarriages of justice of all time. So without further ado, will you please give a very warm welcome to Robert Harris. Thank you. Robert, I thought it would be uh, helpful and possibly a bit of a cheat if we could just begin with a short history lesson. If you could just tell us a little bit, uh, a brief resume about the Dreyfus Affair. Sure. Um, well, it happened, uh, began in October 1894 um, uh, when the um, French uh, military intelligence discovered that someone was passing uh, secret information to the Germans. Uh, they knew this because their a spy, and one of the greatest spies in history, was the cleaner at the German embassy, a Madame Bastien, who used to empty the waste paper basket of the German military attaché, Colonel Schwarzkopf, who was very incompetent and just used to tear things up and put them without military pr Prussian thoroughness uh, in the waste paper bin. And Madame Bastien pretended to take them to the furnace, but actually spirited them out in paper sacks uh, these were pieced together, and they revealed such things as the fact that um, Schwarzkoppen was having an affair with the Italian m military attaché, Major Panazzardi, who would, they would write to one another, my dear bugger, uh, top bugger number one, and they'd use female names. He was also having an affair with the wife of the Dutch councillor, so he cast his favours wide. Anyway, one day, one of the things they pulled out of his waste paper basket and reconstituted was what became known as the Bordereau, which was a covering note uh, that had accompanied uh, five separate items, documents, um, that had been passed to the Germans. And this caused, it was anonymous, this caused a great upset in the uh, French uh, high command, as you can imagine, uh, and they up set up a, a quick um, a mole hunt, and they settled on Alfred Dreyfus, who co not coincidentally probably was the only Jewish officer on the French general staff. He was uh, arrested. He was uh, summarily uh, court-martialed in a secret hearing. Uh, there were only uh, 13 men in the room, seven judges, and one of the men in the room was Colonel Picard, the narrator of my novel. Um, he was found guilty. There was no uh, death penalty for treason, oddly enough, in Paris at that time, even though there were public executions until 1937 in Paris. Uh, but he was therefore uh, degraded in front of 20,000 spectators, all the insignia of rank were ripped from him, with the crowd yelling, uh, death to the Jews and Judas. Uh, he was uh, shipped to Devil's Island, which was open specially for him, a tiny island only a quarter of a square mile, uh, where he was left to rot with five armed guards who uh, were forbidden to speak to him, and clearly the aim, the idea was that he would die quite soon. and. Uh, that was the start of it, and everyone thought that that was the end of it. But in fact, Picard, the observer at the trial, uh, was appointed um, by the French Minister of War to be head of the special section, a statistical section, which had found Dreyfus and handled Madame Bastien. He became head of that section. And about nine months after he'd taken over, Madame Bastien produced another document and this showed there was still a German spy operating on French soil. And at this point, the Dreyfus affair really begins and it becomes a battle uh, as Picard tries to convince his superiors that they got the wrong man. Thank you. Um, and George Picard, the central character, as you say, who you tell the whose eyes you tell the story through, uh, as with the whole book, I mean, it resonates with modern parallels. He is, a, in, in essence, a, a whistleblower. Um, like Sir Edward Snowden or Bradley Manning. Uh, what were the sort of dilemmas facing him? I mean, he had this choice, didn't he, to make? 
Well, yes, Picard was an extraordinary man. And the moment I came across him, it made me want to write the book. He, he spoke six languages. He was born in Alsace, in Strasbourg. When he was 16, the Germans invaded. He was caught up in the siege of Strasbourg. He saw the place uh, destroyed in front of his eyes. His father had already died. Uh, the family were forced to flee to Paris. Um, he had wanted to be a, a musician. He was a very gifted pianist, or possibly a surgeon. But the family had no money. He went to the military academy, paid for by the French Ministry of Defence or Ministry of War, became a very high-flying military man. He became, um, uh, he spoke six languages, as I say. He uh, went to fight in Algeria. He fought in Vietnam. Uh, he got uh, the Legion of Honor. Uh, he was generally seen as one of the coming stars. He, was, he, had, he shared the anti-Semitism of many officers, especially those who came from Alsace. And uh, he was uh, therefore temperamentally highly unsuited to be a whistleblower. He was an insider who for more than 20 years had risen effortlessly through the French army, which was why they made him head of this super secret organization. So when he discovered that there was another spy, uh, his first thought was that, uh, uh, and when he realized that this was the spy and Dreyfus wasn't, his first thought was to approach his superiors in the way that a good staff officer were and say, we've got a problem. Uh, and then to his astonishment, he found himself being told, you know, what does it matter to you if one Jew, Jew stays on a rock? Um, because this would have been such a, a vast embarrassment to the French army to bring him back. And so uh, he found himself court really and it took him a long time it took him a year to finally or nearly a year to finally pluck up the nerve to tell what he knew to his lawyer who was a childhood friend he wrote a last will and testament they sent him to North Africa and sent him tried to send him on a suicide mission in fact and he wrote a, a letter to the French president to be opened in the event of his death um, and he, one recognizes in him a classic uh, figure that one f is familiar with in the newspapers and the movies as well, the man who knows something and who can't make himself heard. And so there was no recourse for him except to make the news public. Mm. And he had this, he felt a moral obligation to uh, stand up for Dreyfus. And yet what I think was in, in, absolutely intriguing about the book is that he didn't particularly like Dreyfus. In fact, you give the impression that he was quite anti-Semitic himself, and yet it was a question of principle. I mean, going back to the modern parallels, the, the statistical section, this uh, intelligence unit, sort of covert intelligence unit, working in crumbling offices behind the, uh, at the back of the Ministry of War, um, it basically has sort of gone rogue, hasn't it? It hasn't got any real control, or, or, um, and it's, it's confused about what it's meant to be doing. I, I was very struck with that, thinking it's, are you again seeing modern parallels with, say, MI5 in, in the 1970s or...? Yes, I think that they're almost inescapable. I mean, the, it was a very small unit, only six, maybe six officers under Pika. They didn't even have a secretary. They were so paranoid about security. And they, they to use the famous phrase of Peter Wright of MI5, they bugged and burgled their way across Paris, really. And it had been ruled for, um, ruled is probably the right word, for about seven or eight years by a rabid anti semite called Jean Sonder, who um, at the time of the Dreyfus affair was actually suffering from tertiary syphilis, general paralysis of the insane. And he really was seeing you know, traitors everywhere. Um, and it was out of control. He used the, the head of um, the statistical section, used to have direct access to the Minister of War. So it was like almost a private channel between the two of them. It didn't officially exist, the unit. Um, you know, it didn't, they didn't appear on the list of officers on, in the French army. It, it was that clandestine. And um, they could do what they liked, and they got used to it. And part of the moral of the book, if, if it does have one, is that you cannot allow that situation to continue, whether it's uh, in a military intelligence, whether it's in the police force, or indeed in the NHS, or indeed any large organization. There must be some form of scrutiny, because otherwise they can invent all the evidence and they can gag uh, anyone who wants to tell the truth about them. So, you know, for me, the Dreyfus Affair has all sorts of ramifications over and beyond just uh, uh, military and defense matters.
And when Dreyfus is uh, sent off to, I think it's a former French penal colony, uh, colony, 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 sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and it's on Devil's Island off the South American coast, um, that, that again had sort of echoes of Guantanamo. Describe what sort of treatment he had to endure when he was on the island. Well, it was um, uh, extraordinary. I mean, he was badly treated from the moment he was arrested. He was arrested in a secret operation in which Picard played a part. C lulling him, made it, they sent him a message saying, please report to the French War Ministry in civilian clothes. Dreyfus wondered what this was about, but he walked in. Picard met him, conducted him up to the Chief, Chief of the General Staff's office, where he was arrested. Uh, he was in prison. He was offered a chance to shoot himself. They gave him a gun. Uh, he refused to do it. He was shipped off then to a military prison. Even the military governor of Paris wasn't told that Dreyfus was there. He disappeared, effectively, as far as the world was concerned. For several weeks, he languished, beating his head against the wall in despair, unable to c contact his family, his wife. No one knew, you know, he didn't know what was going on. Uh, then he was uh, brought before this tribunal, where he was convicted um, on the basis of evidence passed to the uh, judges that wasn't shown to him or the defense, which Picard discovers is indeed a dodgy dossier, even dodgier than certain other dodgy dossiers. And uh, then he was degraded in front of this baying mob. Then he was shipped in a freezing cattle truck to uh, uh, Brittany and put on a warship, taken to um, the um, sweltering heat of the tropics. Uh, he was left in the warship for several days below decks, not allowed out, cooking really in a steel box. Then he was in another prison for 30 days without being allowed out. And then they put him on Devil's Island uh, in a small cell, and next to it was the guard post, and he had to be watched 24 hours a day. So at no point did he, could he really sleep properly. There were all the people clumping around. You know, He had to cook all his own meals. Um, he was just given you know, kind of lumps of meat and so on. He had to scour the island for sort of damp wood. This is the tropics, remember, and, and light to try and cook his food. So he was covered in smoke uh, and... Uh, he, he was very malnourished, and um, as if this was, and no one spoke to him. I mean, that was the worst thing. The guards were forbidden to speak to him, so he couldn't say anything to them, and they wouldn't speak to him. Uh, it was more than two months, I think, before he received any kind of mail from home. And, you know, there's a record, a dispassionate record kept by his captors that was read out later on in court. Uh, that is just about him, you know, sobbing and, you know, one could simply imagine what it was like. He was innocent, you know, and here he was, the most famous prisoner in the world, stuck off in this place. And then finally, uh, they even made these conditions more stringent than at uh, dusk every evening, which comes early in the tropics, until dawn the next day, he was manacled to the bed. They put a kind of metal bar across the bottom of the bed, and his feet had to go in it, and it was clamped. So you can imagine the chafing, and all the time, the insects and the crabs and the heat um, and the rain uh, and they built around his hut uh, a wall seven feet high uh, a yard from the windows and the door so that he couldn't even it was airless and he couldn't even see anything so you know they clearly tried to kill him effectively but he was a incredibly tough physically tough man and he survived it um, and one of the, I found one of the most moving bits in the story, and I don't think it's spoiling it, is at one point he is brought back for a retrial, and you describe his appearance the first time the, the court and the public see him. I mean, that was... Yes, I mean, there was a brilliant description by a, a British journalist uh, called Stevens who said, and in he came, shuffling in, a little white-haired old man of 39, which was um, what he looked like. They, he, they had to put um, tissue paper in his uniform in an attempt to try and pad it out. And his voice, because he'd hardly spoken, you know, he found it quite difficult to hold a conversation, to, to speak. Um, so, you know, the world was outraged by this. You know, Queen Victoria sent the Lord Chief Justice of England to observe the, the second court-martial when he was brought back, uh, when the case was reopened. It was, and there were 300 journalists present who filed per day, and this is in 1899, 600,000 words of copy around the world. It was taken, there was a transatlantic telegraph linked by that point into Brittany, where the trial was held, and all around the world, people wanted to know what he was like, what did he look like, how had he survived, 
and uh, you know you can see it was a sensational story across the globe, front page every day. The Times alone would devote maybe a page, two pages to the Dreyfus trial, verbatim record. That's at the Times, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure the Telegraph were there too. I just couldn't find their articles yeah. online. No. <laughs> now, I was going to ask about this. It is a true story, um, and you've done a lot of research on this. How, how, did you, how did you, what was your main sort of, where did you do your main research? Was it online, or was it... Well, uh, first of all, I read you know a couple of the best books about it. There's many, many books have been written, some of them very good indeed. And um, then I wanted to do my own research because you know, I mean, I love my favourite reading is diaries and journals and letters. I love unmediated, you know, first-hand records. And so there are a hell of a lot of them. I mean, there's the uh, Wren court-martial when he was brought back, there's the Zola libel trial, there's the various investigations into Picard, there are, and then there are all the, the French state uh, very uh, impressively has put the entire newspaper archive uh, up to the Second World War online. So you, if you want to look at Le Figaro for a particular day, you can call it up. Uh, and I use the Times, I use as many contemporary sources as I possibly could, and it yielded a lot of things, you know, that aren't available and I used a lot of maps and so on and I discovered things that historians oddly enough have never commented on just to take one small example this is in the in the novel this man Sondheim who hated the Jews and who was responsible for arresting Dreyfus lived in a street maybe a hundred yards from where Dreyfus lived he lived in a little cobbled street Dreyfus very rich lived in a flat on the avenue de Trocadero overlooking the Seine so every day, they would, he would pass him. And they, uh, you can imagine this, Dreyfus, who had very little limited social skills, trying to talk to this colonel, you know, and this colonel getting more and more furious. And the, in these small details of research, you, you start to really get a sense of how, how people interacted. And Paris, very small at that time. And everyone must have been running across everyone else all the time. Um, so I love the process of research. And really, that's for me when the book starts to come alive. What street did they walk down? What did, you know, on the, the week that uh, Picard took over as head of the special section, there was something in Paris called the Great Stink, which is described in Le Figaro, where the sewers, it got so hot, a, a cloud of smell of filth hung over Paris for about a week. Everyone had to go around with masks and things like this. You know, that sort of detail, you know, is not in any book about the Dreyfus but if you read the press at the time and you know where Picard's going, you know that must be happening. You know, which is a great metaphor for a novelist, really, <laughs> uh, for taking over this section. And but in each case, um, oddly enough, I, I always start with one man, a code breaker, maybe, in, in, in Enigma. You know, what did you do? I mean, what physically did you do? One of my favorite features in journalism, sorry to say the name, is in the Sunday Times, that... <laughs> Uh, a life in the day of. The endless fascination with the minutiae of someone else's daily routine. So to say to a code breaker, I'm not interested in Rommel and all the rest of it, tell me what time did you get up, how did you get into Bletchley Park, where did you sit, what did you actually physically do, where did you hang your hat, you know. Uh, and Pompeii, it was going to Pompeii and smelling water on stone, drying, you know, in the August heat, thinking, how did they do the water here? And I knew it, had, you know, and I, I followed this man's route up to where the water entered Pompeii. And I thought, you know, I feel the sun on my back and Vesuvius up ahead and I can smell this heat. And I thought, you know, yes, you could do that. I could get in his skin. And with Picard was finding out where he, his apartment was and thinking, you know, yes, this is where he'd go. That, for me, is generally one character that I just find interesting and I just want to follow him. You know, like a, a miner with a lamp on his helmet, you know, into the world. Um, and also, uh, another thing that seems to be quite uh, common in your books is, uh, I wouldn't say it's an obsession, but you do like to sort of set the scene with the weather, which is what a lot of writers tell you not to do. Well, I don't understand that. I'm English. I'm interested <laughs> in the weather at all times. And uh, for me, uh, you can't beat a good bit of weather in a novel. Uh, and it's part of the sensation of being, you know, what is a... The sort of novel that I want to write is to sort of, 
is for the reader to feel identification with that world. And what is one of the things that that is? It's if you go out and it's wet or it's cold or a room is stiflingly hot or, you know, all those things, it seems to me, are important to help to bring the reader into the sensation. Uh, you know, I put something in a book, you know, uh, describe, say, a room that's tightly shut with the sun on the window that won't open, and I write those words, and they're just words on a page, but the reader goes back into their own experience and thinks, yeah, I, that touches off. And, that, and then you have this relationship with the reader, which is very intense. So when I read novelists say, the one thing you must do is never mention the weather, I think, well, you carry on like that chum. I'm going <laughs> to put weather in. You have a very, very big following in Germany. Do you, do you send them the draft once you've finished it for it to be translated into German, or how does that work? No, the only way uh, that that can work, and they don't want to be, because so many Germans speak English, they don't want to have all their market you know, buying the English edition. They want to bring it out as near as possible. Uh, I have a German translator I've worked with for a long time, and I, every time I finish you know, three or four chapters, I'll send them to him, he'll translate them. Um, now, one of the glories of modern technology is in Word, but Microsoft Word. I don't know how it works myself, but you, if he's translated from one manuscript and I send him the reworked version, because, of course, I change it as I work, then it highlights all the way through so that he can then go through the t translated version and enter all the changes. He's also a very, with Germanic thoroughness, he checks all my facts as well. So he's a brilliant <laughs> fact checker into the bargain. So I actually thank him in this book for the first time, which I should have done before, really. And uh, so I work with him in that way. And it adds to the general, you know, pres insane process of writing. Um, but it's the way I work, and it wouldn't suit everybody, but it does suit me. And I think that deadlines, you know, it's like adrenaline if you're about to have an accident or something. You know that way that time slows down. Of course, time doesn't slow down. Your reactions quicken. I think the knowledge that you've got to do this every day means that you're, you, you see things more quickly, I think. And it certainly lends itself to a, a book that's supposed to have narrative drive. And a thousand words, you know, lend themselves quite well to engaging the reader's interest. I don't want to be bored writing the book either. You know. um, but I think people would be quite surprised to hear there's no second draft. When you get to the end, you might just look through it a bit for a week, say, and then that's it. And you're also, you've spoken in the past of being helped by the boys in the basement. Could you explain that a little Well, that's a Stephen King phrase. Stephen King wrote a very good book about writing. And uh, he says that writing is done by the boys in the basement, the subconscious when you're asleep. Inspiration is really only a smart word for ideas. And... Uh, I interviewed him once um, when I was a journalist, and he, uh, he writes, the moment he tumbles out of bed, he, doesn't, he just doesn't shave or anything, he just goes and sits straight down, because he says, I think he calls them K-waves in the brain or something. Anyway, your brain is in that state between uh, sleep and wake, and it's at that moment that you're most creative, that you're in most touch with your subconscious, and so, he drives forward and writes, he writes much more than I do per day. He goes, he does it then, early on. Um, and yeah, he, he relies on help from the boys in the basement. And the boys in the basement are best left alone for, you know, 16 hours a day, if you can, or more, 17, 18 hours. The best writing is probably done when you're shop. I think going back to a, a, an officer and a spy, Roman Polanski, I think, was the one who, um, you first, who first introduced the idea, possibly, of you writing for him, did he want you to write a film for it? Because you've written some successful screenplays uh, before, no, notably The Ghost, or did you want to write the novel first? Well, what happened was that after The Ghost, I went out to um, uh, see him in Paris. He wanted to discuss collaborating on a, he wanted to do a thriller. And uh, I had an idea, and I went out and saw him. And he, we were going to make this thriller. And we went out to lunch to uh, discuss it. And over, I'd noticed in his office a lot of books on the Dreyfus Affair. And over lunch, I said, have you ever considered making a film about that? Not that I knew anything about the Dreyfus Affair. And he said, I've always wanted to make a film about the Dreyfus Affair. So my little thriller idea <laughs> went out of the window. And he rang me when I got back to England and said, let's do it. So I started researching with a certain degree of skepticism, discovered Picard, and then I went to Roman and said, look, I think I have to do this as a novel, to be honest. I, I want to get inside his head. 
and to his credit, he said, um, OK, do it as a novel first. I'm always reading novels I want to turn into films. I'm never reading screenplays I want to turn into films. So that's what I did. And uh, he's been a very attentive uh, reader of the manuscript since it's been finished. And um, you know, now we'll see if it can become a film. But novel first, definitely. 150,000 word novel is the huge quarry from which one might now extract a two hour movie. You couldn't possibly do it the other way around, I don't think. You wrote a novel first with The, the Fear Index, your last book, uh, and then you were hired to write the screenplay. Um, yeah. How did that go? Now, that was a very unpleasant experience. Um, you know, I was very privileged to work. We went, let's not go into the controversies about Polanski now, but I was very privileged to work with him as a uh, supreme master of the cinema, so that I would, he would adapt, we were adapting. First we tried Pompeii, and then we did uh, The Ghost. And so I would, we would go through the book, and I would write a few pages of the screenplay, and then he I would read them out to him. And he would be thinking where he'd put the camera and so on. It was a collaboration. Um, with, a, with an American studio, there was none of that. It was simply one wrote it, it disappeared, and various executives then ruminated, and notes were given back to me, and then it disappeared again. And it was, and in the end, I was sort of told, thank you, you've done your contractual services, now we'll bring in someone else. And the director who was going to do it, who was a friend of mine, Paul Greengrass, said, well, if he's not doing it, I'm not doing it. So the whole thing collapsed, and the rights are now uh, with me. So, you know, maybe sometime we'll, someone else will do it. But I realized it was a profound lesson to me. Why did I want to write novels? Because I hate working for anybody else. You know, I really want to just do what I want to do. And the loathsome, however well paid, the loathsome business of working for unseen executives is the reason I became a writer. And I would sooner be the captain of my leaky little tugboat than on the bridge of some super tanker belonging to 20th Century Fox. And, um, you know, so I won't do it again, actually. I don't think I'd ever do it again. I'm conscious that one only has so many books one's going to write, and I'm not going to waste time doing that. Great. Well, shall we take some questions from the floor? Do we have the microphone as well? There's one down at the second row here. Just wait for the microphone. One of the reasons why I came tonight is because if you are, like me, a post-Holocaust Jewish person who was born right after that time, the one story that resonates in your whole lifetime that you hear from your parents and grandparents is Emil Zola. Jacques, mm -hmm. the leaflet he wrote during the Dreyfus case. And it is believed amongst Jewish people of my generation and my parents that that was the event that started the Zionist movement, that Weizmann and several other people who wanted a homeland for the Jews have had enough of anti-Semitism. Does Emil Zola figure in the book? He, cer he certainly does. And uh, for anyone who's buying the Waterstones edition of the novel will find a facsimile of um, Jacques uh, is included with the book. Um, uh, it was Herzl, the, uh, the Zionist, who attended the degradation in Paris, saw what happened to Dreyfus, heard the chanting of the crowd, and um, confirmed years later that that was indeed the moment. That was the gleam that began the State of Israel. Uh, a sense that if you couldn't be safe in Paris, Enlightenment Paris, home of the rights of man. If you weren't safe there, where were you going to be safe? And events were to prove that view correct. And I was very struck writing the book, having written Fatherland, that um, in, pa in France you had a, a country that had been unexpectedly defeated, took great pride in its army, defeated in 1870 by the Germans. Up to that point, there wasn't really, I don't think, much anti-Semitism. After that, the casting around for the scapegoat began. Why was French manhood no longer capable of winning on the battlefield as it had under Napoleon? Where, you know, what was the enemy within? What was the, something that was going wrong? And you know, the, the casting around to blame someone has such parallels with what, what occurred 30 years later, 40 years later with 1918, the stab in the back, you know, because Obviously, up to 1918, Germany was a great place to be Jewish and was uh, a safe place. So, um, you know, this is, it was a, a very central moment in world history, the Dreyfus Affair. 
and uh, we've slightly lost track of it, I think, because of the, 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 the monstrosity of the Holocaust. But really, this is very interesting because it shows it can happen in not just in Germany, but in other civilized European countries. And who knows if we'd suffered a cataclysmic defeat of our army at the end of the 19th century, maybe something similar could have happened here. I don't know. But the, uh, th that's very important. And Emil Zola is in, in, in my novel because Emil Zola wrote Jacuz on the basis of information supplied by Picard, whether directly through his law, indirectly through his lawyer, or directly, we don't know. But I suspect directly, and that's so I, I put that in the novel. Um, and Jacques is a, is, is a fantastic piece of, uh, of journalism, probably one of the greatest there's ever been. And very brave, Zola was sentenced to a year in prison for, for writing it. Yeah, here at the front. Um, Just wait for the microphone. Okay. Um, this could be a spoiler alert. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to read the novel yet. Um, so. Just another question, if you will. But so um, Dreyfus is found innocent, returns to the military. Did they find the real spy? Uh, yes, they knew the real spy. Um, uh, well, Dreyfus was uh, convicted in December uh, 1894, and Picard had found the real spy by the summer of 1896. So, uh, yes. Uh, the real spy suffered the grisly fate of dying in Harpenden. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lived out the last 20 odd years of his life in Harpenden. That's a joke, incidentally, for anyone from Harpenden <laughs> uh, watching this. Uh, yes, no, they knew who it was, Esther Harsey, and he fled and lived out his life in exile. He fled to Britain um, in about 1899, I think, and he died after the First World War. So he lived for over 20 years in Britain, um, still proclaiming his innocence. Yeah. So um, the British well, they didn't protect him, but those, this was the days before extradition treaties, and um, you know, in fact, the French government, the last thing they wanted to do was <laughs> extradite Esterhaz. It would have been, as his name was, it would have been incredibly embarrassing. So it suited them to leave him in Britain. A very uh, cowering name. Hmm. Well, I think there must. It can't be an entire coincidence, can it? I don't think. Here, in the middle here, in the maroon. Hi there. Um, Hello. I'm wondering if you say that you want to always kind of follow what you want to do as one of the main reasons you write. I wonder if that ever conflicts with what you perceive a reader wants or if there's any tension there. Well, no. Um, to be honest, I'm not trying to point, paint myself in any shining light, but I think that any, any writer will tell you that the only way you can write a decent book is to write what you want to write. And if you're lucky and fortunate, um, the public, uh, enough people will want to read it. But the shortest way to disaster is to try to give the public what they want, because they, you, de you detect the phony immediately. Um, if I may use a swear word from quoted by Gore Vidal, who used to quote the, the wise hack at the writer's table in Hollywood, Shit has its own integrity, that's what he used to say. <laughs> and uh, so works of popular fiction are written from the heart. I'm not just talking about mine. I'm talking about any, any uh, airport thriller. I bet you'll find that the, art, the, the writer thinks they're doing the very, very best thing that they can and they're most interested in. And I always know when people come up to me and talk about writing, if they start saying they're trying to do something for the market, I know they're finished. You'd never do it. You have to believe in it, whatever you're doing, and hope that everyone else does too. So and my publishers have been very loyal about that. And, and, and when I suggested doing a novel about the Dreyfus affair, they absolutely leapt at it, which slightly surprised me as I thought that the Dreyfus affair, that might be qu quite a tough sell. But uh, they were very loyal about it, as they have been throughout with all my books. I mean, I'm sure all they've ever wanted me to do is write Fatherland 2. Uh, <laughs> And maybe one day I'll be so hard up if um, I have to pay the mansion tax and the rest of it, <laughs> I'll have to be doing it. But at the time moment, no. Here, over there on the left. Robert Aitken, I'm sorry to hear you speak. Um, other characters, I'm interested to hear, can you throw any light on his wife and 
they feel that able to galvanize the board or just in a doctor in a dictated way? What would her position and how would she react? Well, there is a brilliant novel to be written about her, Lucy Dreyfus, very young, uh, early 20s, when her husband failed to come home for lunch, which was the first she knew that anything had happened. And uh, she played the most magnificent role in all this. She shielded the children. She uh, told them their father had gone away on a secret mission. She took them out of school. They were only about five and two, I think, something like that. And indeed, um, Ruth Harris, the expert on Dreyfus, who wrote a very good book at it, believes that E. Nesbitt modeled the railway children on Lucy Dreyfus and her children and saying that daddy's away, uh, you know. Uh, and so she did that, and she, w she w appeared always in public in black, wearing widow's clothes. She never spoke publicly until for several years, at least. She was called as a witness at, at the Zola libel trial and stood terrified uh, at the witness stand, and then her evidence was ruled inadmissible. So she went and sat down, and we never heard her voice. But she was uh, incredibly loyal to him. She was very wealthy. Her family actually were more wealthy even than the Dreyfuses. And uh, they were diamond merchants, I think, from Antwerp. or Certainly, they, that was their business. Uh, she stood by him. I don't think he was an easy man before he went away. I'm sure he wasn't an easy man when he came back. Uh, she long outlived him. He died in 1937. It wasn't an easy thing to live through the German occupation of France with the name Dreyfus. Uh, and uh, from having been very wealthy, she lived, she spent her years, her 70s, they must have been, or late 60s, uh, cleaning clothes and working as a sort of seamstress in the southern France. She managed to survive. Um, her granddaughter uh, died in Auschwitz and uh, she died I think in the 40s but she was a heroic uh, unsung uh, person in this whole story and there is I've, I've written this story from the point of view of Picard uh, because that's the world that interests me but uh, there is a brilliant novel to be written by someone else uh, from the point of view of the family and from her point of view in particular. Earlier? Do you think the uh, Dreyfus affairs had a lasting impact on French society? And to that end, how do you anticipate the novel will be received in France itself? Well, it certainly had a, um, um, a seismic effect on French society. There's no doubt about that. Um, indeed, the separation of church and state um, came directly out of the Dreyfus affair. Uh, it had a huge effect on the army. Um, it um, lingered on for decades, and for decades there were still plenty of people who thought that Dreyfus was guilty. Um, and perhaps the single most um, startling thing in the novel, in a way, is a footnote I put in. Um, one of the men who um, was responsible, most responsible, for secretly imprisoning Dreyfus and berating him and interrogating him and all the rest of it, was a man called uh, Colonel Dupaty Duclam. And uh, at one point, my hero, Picard, goes to see him in his apartment as the whole case is unraveling, you know, and goes to see him to say, you know, ask him, what on earth were you doing? And there's a photograph, I couldn't resist this, in Dupaty Duclam's apartment of himself and his wife and a baby. The baby is one year old at this point, and I couldn't resist the footnote which says, Charles Dupaty Duclam. Uh, 1894 to uh, 1947, head of Jewish affairs uh, in Vichy. Um, so you know, it, yes, there's a, there's a there is a sort of continuum there. As to how the novel will go down in France, I wouldn't like to say. I, I can hardly begin to guess. Uh, on the one hand, the system in the end worked. Uh, Picard is very French, and they did triumph, and they did sort it out. But um, on the other hand, um, it's quite shocking. And I cannot, imp although I'm, I'm not one of those that said the British are wonderful, we'd never have done this, that and the other, I cannot imagine the circumstance in which the British would have laid on uh, 
20,000 people watching while someone had their insignia stripped from their uniform. I mean, that is quite a shocking thing. Or the burning of the books. Zola's books were burnt on the banks of the Seine. You know, an strange prefiguring of what was to come later. It, that is, it's quite startling, I think, quite shocking. But, you know, I don't think one can make glib, you know, one can't be glib about it, as I say. You know, they confronted it, they sorted it out, uh, and they, they made it straight in the end. The great granddaughter, I think, of Dreyfus, the old Pearl Ruiz, um, said recently that um, Dreyfus, despite everything, wasn't disparaging of his country, and he mentioned it very little towards the end of his life. Um, can you shed some light at all why, despite everything, he would go so far as to stand up for France and everything that France stands for? Well, he was um, a great patriot. He fought in the First World War. In fact, he returned to the army and, and fought uh, in, the, in, the, in the First World War. And um, I think that um, he wanted no pity. I think he was a difficult man, Dreyfus. I think most people, he even acknowledged it himself. Um, and there was this scene in his second court-martial where they read out what had happened to him the terrible afflictions that he'd suffered. And even the French general staff were, according to witnesses in court, shocked and shifty when they heard this. And then the, the man in charge of the president of the court said to the, the Dreyfus president, do you wish to say anything? He said, uh, I have no wish at all to comment on the conditions in which I was kept. I've come here purely to clear my name uh, for myself and for my children. And that's all he said. He wanted no... You know, and that, that's very, uh, that's something about the man, and it's something about Picard himself, that it was a matter of doing duty, you know. It's almost um, a kind of attitude we've lost. I don't know that people think like that anymore. One of the difficulties of writing a novel like this is to think how that generation were about these things, the stoicism, the kind of, you know, keeping quiet about things, not making a fuss about it, you know, that sort of thing. There wasn't a lot of weight, weeping and wailing. That's quite different to our own age, where, you know, every time you turn on the television, someone's blubbing on a singing competition or something. So, uh, you know, I think he was a very, he was a very impressive man, I mean, um, is the truth of it, and a, and a loyal French patriot. Are there any more questions? One more here. We'll take these last two, and then we'll. I heard your interview on the Today program, and you made again the point about the one thing that you really impressed on you was the need for scrutiny of public institutions. And I was just, and of course you, you explained how you chose this book because of the of Picard. Um, what about? the things that you might have learned happens to people, the, the, and now you're touching on it, the people today who, who want to be like Stephen Lawrence's mother, all the people that want to have Zola write an article in the paper about some injustice. W would you say that it's the newspapers that do it, or um, bold people, brave people? What is the answer to, to what you found out? after doing all this research? Well, I think, I think what I feel in most... I mean, by and large, the papers will print a good story if it comes along. There isn't a conspiracy to, to suppress a story. The question is, how do you get hold of the intelligence in the first place? How do we discover exactly what is going on? And as I say, I don't just mean here the intelligence or the police. I mean any big institution. How do we find out what they're doing? And we have to rely, I think, in the end, on, on brave individuals who are willing to come forward and be uh, uh, derided and denounced and traduced and, uh, and, and, and given, torn to pieces in public. And first of all, totally agree with you about weather. I'm a big, big U-boat weather fan. Um, <laughs> first question is, I don't think the DVD of Fatherland did really enough credit to the book. And the first question is, if someone were to remake that, would you be up for that being remade? 
the second question is, I noticed in, in Officer of Spy, you've written it first hand in the first person. Um, I think your first books I've read of yours are all in the third person, which I've really enjoyed. This, to me, would be a departure. Is there a particular reason why you, why you wrote it in the first hand as opposed to the, the, the third person? Um, well, as to the first, um, I can't stand the film of Fatherland, I've, um, I'm afraid. Uh, it's not very good. It has clunking plots, uh, twists, and the rest of it. Well, not even twists. I mean, um, that's a <laughs> plot M1s, I would say. And uh, so I'm not keen on that, and I ha don't have the rights. There are, from time to time, there is talk of remaking it. The Germans were going to remake it, which would be fascinating. Um, so, and I hope that one day that that happens. Um, your second point um, was about um, first, person. first person. Well, I, I, actually, it's, I've written three novels before this in the first person. Two Cicero novels, which are written from the point of view of his secretary, and The Ghost, which is written from the point of view of the ghostwriter. Um, with this one, I, when you take a story that's so much based in fact, and mo this book is almost entirely factual, in terms of the main events that occurred and the characters. If I do that in the third person, then I really am so close to simply writing a costume drama where everyone, where it's just like a work of history. I had to somehow f to elevate it into some, s make it distinctive. And the best way to do that, I thought, was to do it through the, invent the personality of Picard and pretend that he wrote a memoir immediately after the event which he then put in a bank vault to be read 100 years after his death. 100 years after his death is January 2014. So that's my view. That my, in my mind, the way I was able to convince myself to write it, I thought that is what I'm writing. And that, I think, what unlocked the book for me. It, it made it you know, personal and particular and not just a, a recitation of, of fact. <laughs>